This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University, and today I wanted to talk about everything that's wrong with Bitcoin. This is going to be an answer video to much of the FUD that we see surrounding Bitcoin, and this was inspired by Zubin Warden, who had a comment basically with a list of objections to Bitcoin. It's slow, it's expensive, it has scalability issues, it's energy intensive, etc. The first objection that he spoke about, and we're going to go through these, all seven of them, one by one. The first one is that the license is owned by MIT. This is a common misconception. Having an MIT license does not mean that the university there controls your software. What it is, is it's a very common open source software license. And it enables you to do all these different things. If we take a look at the GitHub for Bitcoin Core, which is the main Bitcoin software, we can see that having an MIT license basically gives you commercial use, modification, distribution, private use, etc. The only limitations are liabilities and warranties. So you can copy Bitcoin software, you can change it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want with it. It's in no way controlled by the university, by MIT. Objection number two, that Bitcoin runs on a hashing algorithm created by the NSA. This in fact is true. We have SHA-2 and then all the derivatives. SHA-256 is the proof of work algorithm that Bitcoin miners use. And it looks something like this, where you have an input and then you have an output. So you basically hash the input and you calculate the output. In this case, my input is XRP and HEX are both stupid scams in my opinion, and in reality, one, two, three, four, five, six. And when you hash this, when you apply this hashing algorithm to it, it creates a unique output that cannot be reverse engineered to give you the input. So this is, this is a mathematical algorithm. And like most mathematical algorithms and equations, etc., they're not controlled by the inventors or the discoverers of them. So for example, Greeks, Greek people do not control triangles just because Pythagoras was Greek. Muslims do not control algebra just because some uh, early explorations into algebra were done by Muslims. Italians do not control pasta, though I wish they did. And Americans do not control hamburgers. And likewise, the NSA does not control the SHA-256 hashing algorithm. There's no workaround for it. There's really no way of reverse engineering it that anyone knows about. So math is math. We don't have to worry about the NSA controlling SHA-256. And I don't trust the NSA either, uh, though I do love them and they're probably listening to this video. If you're enjoying this video so far, please hit that subscribe button and hit the like button as well. Objection number three, the code was created by anonymous, but not anonymous to Homeland Security. I think this is uh, quite likely untrue because if the US government ever knew who Satoshi was, he would have been jailed very early on and used to sabotage the project. 2008 to 2009, when Bitcoin was invented and released, was really the last time to be anonymous before the widespread tech surveillance that we're now all subject to took off. And so that's one of the many reasons why it's now, imp now impossible to recreate a crypto launch like Satoshi did. The launch of Bitcoin, as I've said many times on this channel, was an immaculate conception that can never be repeated. It's very, very unlikely that the U.S. government or anyone else knows who Satoshi is. If the U.S. government, if any government, if any security organization, if any media organization knew who Satoshi was, it would be very, very difficult to keep the secret at this point, and I think it would have been leaked. Objection number four, Bitcoin is too slow at just seven transactions per second. I think this misses the fact that each of those transactions can be have different fiat values attached to them. So each transaction, each of those seven transactions per second, and in practice, it's more like four, four or five transactions per second last time I checked, but each of those transactions can be a $100 transaction, a $100 million transaction, or a $100 billion transaction. And so Bitcoin scales uh, very well in this way. Bitcoin scales just fine as a global settlement network. And I think when people say that Bitcoin is too slow at seven transactions per second, they don't realize how many trans transactions per second the current settlement system of the US dollar uses. This is Fedwire. In 2022, it had a certain number of transactions. If we do the math, about 196 million transactions per year. There are only 240 business days in the year, roughly, when Fedwire runs. It doesn't work on weekends and bank holidays, holidays unlike Bitcoin. That comes down to 816,000 approximately transactions per business day. And when you calculate how many transactions per second, I've done all the math here, Fedwire does about 9.45 transactions per second, which is the same order of magnitude as Bitcoin's five, six, seven transactions per second. So we can see here how you can run a global settlement network using just 
uh, a few transactions per second. This is usually a talking point that's used to sell uh, altcoins like Solana, for example, having 20,000 transactions per second or whatever they claimed. Just because something's fast doesn't mean it's secure or decentralized or neutral. Also, it's important to remember when we make these comparisons that Bitcoin is not PayPal, Bitcoin is not Visa. Bitcoin's base layer is a final settlement network itself, just like Fedwire, while PayPal and Visa ride on top of the US banking system, which itself is secured by proof of war and relies on the US government. By contrast, Bitcoin does not rely on the actions or the protections of any government, and Bitcoin offers final settlement and is a bearer asset, much like physical gold, but much better because it's scarcer and it's much easier to transport over long distances and to store. So Bitcoin, the base layer, offers these very nice final settlement assurances, and then cheaper and faster solutions can be built on top of this incredibly stable and secure base layer. We saw with Solana, for example, how unstable the base layer was and how it kept crashing. Layer two solutions like the Lightning Network that are built upon the Bitcoin network, about upon the uh, the base layer, they can theoretically do up to a million transactions per second. By contrast, Visa today can only do 24,000 transactions per second. So Visa is actually the thing that's too slow, not Bitcoin. Gold is too slow also as a final settlement network. It can take years to transport gold from one country to another to create final trade settlements. The next objection is that Bitcoin is too expensive. And in answer to this, I would ask a question, says who? Says someone who doesn't use Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a free market of transaction fees, a free transaction fee market, and no one is forcing anyone to transact on the Bitcoin network. Unlike the US dollar network, where many of us are forced to transact, for example, to pay our taxes, Bitcoin is a completely voluntary opt-in system and no one has to use it who doesn't want to. So it's very strange for someone standing outside the system to say it's too expensive. It's like someone who doesn't play a particular sport or have a particular hobby saying it's too expensive. If you're not interested in it, you really shouldn't have an opinion about people who are interested in it. Some people do seem to find value transacting in Bitcoin and they're willing to pay transaction fees to do it, and that's a free clearing market. So it's a little bit crazy, especially if you believe in free markets, to say a certain market is too expensive. Maybe the questioner means something else by this question. Maybe he means that the unit price of Bitcoin is too high at $30,000 per Bitcoin. Well, I would answer to that that Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's stock, at least the A shares, are currently $521,000 per share, and there still seems to be people willing to buy it. Of course, there are B shares available as well, but the basic principle stands that you can't really look at unit price to gauge demand. There are a lot of people in this world with a lot of money who are willing to transact in high value units. Also, it's important to remember that you don't need to buy a whole Bitcoin. One Bitcoin is comprised of 100 million Satoshis or sats, so you can easily buy just a few dollars worth of Bitcoin. You don't need $30,000 to buy Bitcoin. I think it's also very misleading. It's a misleading metric to look at unit price. You need to look at market cap and fundamentals. These are much more important. So for example, the crypto XRP is not cheap because it trades for 47 cents while Bitcoin trades for $30,000 a coin. In the same way that penny stock XYZ is not cheap because it trades for 5 cents a share on its way to zero while Apple trades for $188 a share. You get what you pay for and the share value or the unit value don't matter as much as the fundamentals and how the market is currently valuing those fundamentals via the market cap. You can have a pumpkin pie. It doesn't matter how many slices there are, you still have a whole pumpkin pie. And in this way, market cap is very similar to that. And the unit, we could have, Satoshi could have created 42 million units. That would have been fine. Uh, it's really fairly arbitrary. The point is that is a, it's a fixed maximum supply. So it's very misleading to focus on unit price. You have to look at the fundamentals and then you have to look at those fundamentals versus the market cap. So Bitcoin, for example, now has a market cap of nearly 600 billion. Gold, which is a similar thing if you think of Bitcoin as digital gold, physical gold has a market cap of 12 trillion. Real estate has a global market cap above 300 trillion. And I think that uh, real estate, Bitcoin is a form of digital real estate. It's a form of digital gold. And so there's still lots of room for Bitcoin to demonetize these other assets and to take market share from them. $30,000 is not a big deal. $600 billion for the market cap of Bitcoin. I think it's headed to $100 trillion uh, market cap and beyond.
Question number six or objection number six, Bitcoin has scalability issues. We already talked about seven transactions per second and how each transaction can scale. Each one can be $100 per transaction or $100 million in terms of transactional value or $100 billion in terms of the value that's being settled in a single transaction. So it scales just fine as a global settlement network. And as we already discussed, they're cheaper and faster transactions available on layer twos like the Lightning Network, for example. And this is the correct way to scale money is through layers. And this is how every financial system works, including the US dollar. You wanna have a very nice, strong, fundamental uh, uh, foundation for your currency, and then you build different layers upon this. So for example, we have Fedwire, then we have US banks, we have commercial banks, and we have uh, various financial apps and financial companies that run on top of the banks. Etc. So this is the proper way to scale a network and not try to do everything at the base layer as certain other cryptocurrencies try to do. And that just leads to blockchain bloat and lots of security issues. Objection number seven is that Bitcoin is energy intensive. Well, lots of things are energy intensive. Air conditioning is energy intensive. The internet and computers are energy intensive, but they do add value to a civilization. And if you um, want to live in a mud hut and not use any electricity, that's one thing. But modern civilizations are energy intensive. I think it's also unfair to compare Bitcoin to the energy world of rainbows and unicorns. You need to compare it with viable systems that can exist and work and settle value in the real world. So for example, Bitcoin is secured by proof of work. We already talked about the SHA-256 algorithm. US dollar is secured by proof of war. So when we're comparing solutions, the real question is not just how much energy Bitcoin uses, how much energy does the US military use to secure the dollar? And what are the implications? What are the, what's the collateral damage that's caused by this? What is the carbon footprint of the US military? This looks like it has a very bad carbon footprint. For example, if you look at the bombing of Baghdad in 2003 and all the other wars that have followed, if you look at the numbers, Bitcoin demand for electricity is just 0.68%, in other words, less than 1% of global energy, global electricity consumption. So that's a very small number. And if you compare it to something, for example, like internet porn, which uses 3.5% of global electricity, it's strange we never hear the ESG movement attacking pornography for its energy usage or cat videos or data centers or anything like this. And this may be because it's good for our elites to have a society of weak men addicted to pornography to rule over. But if you're gonna stop, try to stop Bitcoin for its energy usage and its electricity usage, I would expect uh, the ESG to be fair and also to go after things like internet porn and cat videos, not to put those in the same category, of course. If you wanna investigate that more, I have a video here called Bitcoin, Gold, ESG, and Porn, which I will link to in the description notes below. Finally, Zubin Warden ends his comment by saying, I don't trust MIT, I don't trust Homeland Security, I can't trust Satoshi, and I certainly don't trust the NSA. For all these reasons, Bitcoin has never been in my portfolio. I hope now, Zubin Warden, after watching this video, you'll reconsider Bitcoin. The really good news is that you don't need to trust Satoshi either. Bitcoin runs just fine, and it actually runs much better without him being around. You don't have to trust me either. In fact, this is one of the things that's very nice about Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners don't trust, they verify. So I'm very glad that you asked this question and enabled me to talk about these various FUD issues that surround Bitcoin. If you have any further questions, I'd encourage you to put them in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video and leave a comment or question or future topic suggestion in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching and I'll see you in the next video.